Now I want to talk about uh, color in this guide, and in particular two things, how to see and think about color a little bit differently, because as, as painters or as, as artists, we're not cameras. We don't want to just reproduce or copy exactly what's there. Even cameras don't do that anymore with Photoshop. People take photographs and they play with them and, and they come up with an original image, not a copy much anymore. So same thing with painting. We don't want to copy what's there. Uh, the photograph or if we're outside, the image we're seeing is just a place to start. And we want to think about two things with color. The first is seeing color, seeing color as an artist. And when we look at a landscape, whether it's outside or from a photograph, we naturally tend to isolate an area and try to mix a color that matches what we see. It's much more effective to compare colors that are next to each other than think in terms of colors on a color wheel. So, first of all, when we look at an area in the landscape, then look away to another area, we get a fresher view. For example, a distant group of trees may look green, but when we compare them to the trees in the foreground, then the trees in the background will appear a lot bluer. And an example of that is this photograph on top. It's a cliff in Sedona. And the trees on the hillside back there, way in the distance, um, appear really green. But when we compare them to the more yellow-green trees in the foreground, or even the yellow-green on the grass, we realize how much bluer those trees are. So when we get a comparison, from one shape in the background to another shape in the foreground, or even shapes that are next to each other. We get a better feel for what the color is. Another example is if I'm looking at a sunlit road, it may appear to have a bluish color, but if I look away to the shadow on the road, then the sunlit area looks a lot warmer or more orange. And when here we're talking about light, uh, sunlight and shadow, and it's important to remember that the sunlit area has to look warm in our painting. Warm compared to the shadow. Shadows are cooler generally and uh, sunlit areas are warmer. Um, and a lot of times in the light area, like in this photograph, the road can appear gray or bluish or kind of a violet. But we have to think of it first as warm because that's what suggests sunlight. And that's what we want to do is suggest the light, suggest the values, the light, um, not copy, try and copy the color. So when I look at the shadow, the shadow looks really blue. And out of my peripheral vision, I see how much warmer that sunlit area looks. So again, always compare, look away to another value um, a, a shadow. When you're looking at a sunlight, look, sunlit area, look at a shadow area. When you're looking at a background color, look at something in the foreground and kind of compare. So you get a comparison. When we try to get an accurate color by staring at an area, area, our eyes can get fatigued. So if I'm just staring and staring, our eyes kind of get tired. You may not feel it, but they don't see the color or the value for that matter as well. Now second, when trying to decide how to mix a color, so we're going from how to see a color to now we're talking about mixing. Uh, when I'm trying to decide how to mix a color, we'll see it. it's more effective to start with a color from the color wheel. Our eyes see through red, yellow, and blue cones. And I know nothing about the eye. This is just what I was told in art school. So, so we identify with colors composed from primaries or from the color wheel. Our eyes can't break down black or earth colors, so we don't identify with them as quickly as colors from the color wheel. So when we're looking at a painting, I think paintings that use more primary, secondary colors, colors from the color wheel, um, we, we just see them better. We can identify them better. and We can break them down. Um, when you look at the mixtures of color, on the uh, photograph here, I've got a cad yellow, a lizard crimson, and blue, and I've mixed the colors in between. I can look at those in between colors and I can see the yellow and I can see the blue to make the green, or the blue and the red to make the violet. My eye can really identify those, but if I'm using black or earth colors, 
my eye doesn't break those down as much. Um, if I make a decision to start with a color from the color wheel, then I make it the right value, how dark or light it is, and then modify it with a complement, I'll get a more natural looking color. So that's kind of my steps in mixing. I look at an, a, an area, a shape, a plane that I'm uh, in the photograph or if I'm outside, uh, I decide what color from the color wheel I need to start with that best represents that color. Then I have to make it the right value and then I modify it, usually meaning I add a little bit of the complement to gray it because I don't want the color necessarily, not always, um, I don't want it real strong. I want to knock it down so I keep in reserve stronger color. Um, and I'm not saying you shouldn't use earth colors. A lot of artists use earth colors and they use them real effectively. But when we think of the color wheel as pure color that the eye can process better and that color is cleaner, then we can be better equipped to use earth colors as modifiers instead of just always trying to mix that local color. And again, you can see on that mixture, um, I can mix the whole color wheel with just a yellow, blue, and a red. And that's a good place to start sometimes, is just um, cad yellow light. Um, I use alizarin crimson for the red, sometimes cad red medium, and ultramarine blue and white. And do small studies with that. And you really learn a lot about mixing color because you have to mix everything. But I get a cleaner color, more identifiable if I use the color wheel to decide what color to use. If I don't do that, I'm trying to mix and mix until I match what I see or what's in the photograph. And my colors are, on my palette down here, is titanium white, cad yellow light, uh, yellow ochre, which I don't have right now. I've taken that out. Um, I'm sticking with more pure colors. I it might add it another year or so, who knows. Uh, cad red light. I've replaced uh, the, cad ye or the yellow ochre with uh, cadmium orange. And then the cad red light, I've gone to more of a medium or a deep. Uh, but this particular palette right here is fine to use. And then uh, Indian red, which I do not have anymore. It's a it's an earth color. Uh, alizarin crimson, ultramarine blue, deoxazine purple, viridian hue, and cerulean blue hue. Again, this is a good color, a good palette to use. And do a lot of exercises where you just use the white, yellow, um, blue and alizarin crimson. Now I have to use a, make sure I use a cad yellow light, a pure cad, cad yellow. Don't use a hue for the cad yellow light. I do use a hue once in a while for the orange and for the cad red light or the cad red medium, whichever I'm happy to use. Um, Cause I don't need them necessarily that strong. Although the cadiums are, are, are good for the orange and the red, but I definitely have to have it for the yellow. Now, the next thing is the value of color. As much as we love color, it's the value that makes a painting work. That's why pencil drawings, pen and ink drawings, black and white photography are so effective because it's the large shapes of contrasting values that make the composition work. Color might be more emotional, but values are the foundation for composition, weight and mass. Uh, they just set up everything, the values do. So, the um, old saying is color gets all the glory, but values do all the work is certainly true. The purpose of values in a landscape is to create depth. Our canvas is flat, a two-dimensional surface, and we want the illusion of depth and volume in our painting. So I'm talking about, um, you know, this is a pamphlet on color, but we just have to recognize that the important thing about color is the value. We'll also talk about value later and I'll kind of re-emphasize the same thing. But you can see the photograph here of a desert scene in uh, Tucson, Arizona. If I can see it, those shadow patterns, the dark values in a large pattern, that helps me to simplify the shapes and it helps me to draw it on the canvas better. The second aspect of uh, value are the planes of a landscape. Uh, to create depth on a flat surface, we have to have value changes every time the
the form changes. And if we can create large planes that are different values, our painting will have a sense of depth. Uh, and there are four large planes of a landscape. So number one is the sky plane, uh, the flat plane, number two, number three is slanted plane, and four is upright. Uh, and I force everything into those four planes. That helps me simplify what I'm seeing. So I'm not seeing detail, I'm seeing large shapes. And when any of these four planes are the same value, it flattens out the painting. So you can see, um, I've got two examples here of the planes. The one on the left uh, has the value of the sky plane, um, and then kind of a slanted plane. Number two is the flat. Number four is the darkest, is, is the uh, vertical plane, upright plane. And that's generally how it translates. Sky is generally the lightest. The ground is the uh, next lightest. Then um, the slanted mountains, rooftops, hills, they're usually the third lightest or next to the darkest. And then the darkest is always the vertical. Now, not always, but generally, everything being equal, the sun straight overhead, sunlit day, um, no cast shadows in the foreground, no snow on the ground. You know, it's a lot of variables, but generally, that's how it works out value-wise. Sky the lightest, vertical, upright plane the darkest. But again, depends on the light, time of day, and everything. Um, the third aspect of value is the effect of atmosphere. Objects getting lighter as they recede into the distance. Now the color of light and shadow, um, all the objects in a landscape have a local color to them. And that's what usually we're trying to copy, what we're trying to match. Um, blue sky, green tree, red barn, yellow field. But local color isn't the color we're after. In other words, it really doesn't matter if I'm painting the red barn red or not. What matters is I get the effect of the light. Now, I might choose to paint it red, but it's the effect of sunlight and shadow on that red barn or on the tree that uh, really matters. If my goal in painting is always to suggest the light and atmosphere, then I want to paint the color of the light and shadow, not local color. Um, that's a lot more important, painting the effect of the light in the light and shadow uh, and not just matching the color. Sunlight has a warmer color to it, like yellow, yellow, orange, orange, red, orange. So everything in the sunlight, no matter what the color is, local color, I want one of those warmer colors in it. Yellow is the warmest and red, orange is um, the least warm, but all of those colors in between are, are warm colors. And I want to make sure they're in the uh, mixture for the light areas. Um, so here you see that on, on this painting, the cliffs are, you know, they're, they're an orange color. I'd probably pick yellow orange as the color to use from the color wheel. Then I modify it with a little violet to kind of gray it, get it the right value. But it's the yellow orange that makes it look sunlit, but that's also the local color. Same thing with the tree. The local color of the tree here is yellow. So, you know, it's going to look sunlit uh, because I'm using a local color of yellow. But the barn is different. The color on the barn is more of a red-violet. You know, it's an old, worn-out wood. So I have to add red, I'm sorry, red, you know, red-orange, orange, or yellow-orange in there uh, to make it look warm. So in here, I added red-orange to a violet um, to get that color. Again, I want it to look warm compared to the shadow. The shadow color is cooler compared to the sunlit and picks up more sky color. So the shadow color is more blue, blue-violet, blue-green. And you have that on the color wheel, that, you know, half the cool colors, half the warm colors. Um, and you want to use the cooler colors when you're in the, in the shadows. When the sunlight hits an object, the local color changes to a warmer version on the color wheel. And you can see on the painting here below the red barn, um, the barn is red. When the sun hits it, though, it turns to a red-orange. 
because again, I'm, I'm, use, I'm mixing a color that best suggests the light. And the local color isn't that important. Um, and then the shadow of the barn turns more of a red violet. The local color of the barn can be seen better on a cloudy day when there isn't the effect of sunlight and shadow. So on a cloudy day, you don't have that bright, warm light changing the color on the local barn or the darker, cooler uh, shadow from the lack of sunlight making it cooler. So you have more of just the local color on a cloudy day because red isn't really warm or cool. It's just red. But on a sunlit day, where the sun hits it, it turns to a red orange and the shadow turns to a red violet. A green tree turns to more of a yellow green in the sunlight and blue green in the shadow. Or in this case, I have a yellow orange tree that um, stays yellow orange in the sunlight because that's real warm. But it turns to a darker violet with some red orange in it um, for the shadow. So again, I have to add the shadow color to the darker value of the shadow. The color of distance. Just like the values get lighter as objects and planes recede into the distance, color also changes as it recedes. The color gets cooler as it goes into the distance. That's why we have to compare background colors to foreground colors. Um, don't isolate them and try and match what you see. You want that difference. I want colors looking cooler as they recede, no matter what the photograph gives me. Now the color can remain the same as it recedes, like the red barn is still red when it's way in the distance, but it's more affected by the color of the atmosphere between the viewer and the object in the distance. So it's going to get cooler as it recedes. Um, if we give depth or distance a color, it would be blue, blue-violet, blue-green. Warmer colors fade faster in the distance as a yellow tree, like in the painting below, these yellow aspens, as they go back into the distance, they start to fade. Yellow is the first color to fade. Then it disappears way in the distance, um, way back in the far background mountains. If there's any yellow back there, you wouldn't see it it becomes more of a violet and finally becomes just more of a blue, a muted blue that's left in the distance. Like the farthest mountains back in there, is, that's all you can see is blue. And it's that comparison of the distant cooler colors with the foreground warmer colors that makes things, makes things work. So it helps to be aware of the color of depth and be able to push it to create more depth in your painting. And here the same thing in this painting. I, I don't use hardly any yellow in the background and I use real strong yellow in the foreground. Um, so I'm, I'm naturally cooling things as I go back. Even though there's warmth on the shadow or on the uh, mountain, sunlit area of the mountain in the background, it's still really cool compared to the foreground. It's warm compared to the shadow in the background, the mountain is. Um, but everything stays back there. It's, in comparison, it's cooler in the foreground. And that's, that's the key to creating depth, is using the value, getting lighter as it goes back, and the color getting cooler. It's not about matching, matching the color. So if that's the one thing we take away, is learn to use the colors on your palette to suggest the light in your painting. Don't worry about matching the, uh, the photograph. Photograph is just a place to start.